I am Ruth Langer, who is the interim director of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning at Boston College. Uh, and I have the privilege of welcoming virtually Dr. Jesper Svartvig, who is the holder of our Corcoran chair and uh, visiting with us for this year. Uh, but visiting virtually thanks to the pandemic and the difficulties of getting from Sweden. So we're particularly glad that he's joining us today from his home in Lund, Sweden. Uh, we ask that everyone keep themselves muted while he is speaking and that if you have questions that come up to utilize the chat bar to uh, to submit questions to the to the speaker and we will moderate them and uh, and and get them to you or get them to him. If you are uncomfortable being recorded, uh, this lecture is being recorded. So if you are uncomfortable with that, please uh, turn off your camera. And uh, this event is going to be publicly visible, available on our website and various social media accounts uh, as soon as the video has been processed. Uh, we ask that you use speaker view rather than gallery view for the event, just because there's so many people on it. So to introduce our speaker, Jesper Svartvik holds a doctorate in New Testament studies from Lund University, where he held the Christer Stendhal Chair of Theology of Religions. His areas of expertise include New Testament studies, interreligious relations in general, and Jewish-Christian relations in particular. Dr. Svartvik is the author of 10 books, which include his English language, Mark and Mission, on Mark 7, 1 to 23, in, in its uh, narrative and historical context. He's also the co-editor of four volumes, including Christ Jesus and the Jewish People Today, New Explorations of Theological Interrelationships, and the soon forthcoming Enabling Dialogue About the Land, a resource book for Jews and Christians. And with that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Svartvik to unmute himself and to speak to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure and privilege to be this academic year's holder of the Corcoran Visiting Chair at Boston College and to be invited to give this lecture, the purpose of which is to present my research project. I've decided to call the lecture Reading the New Testament Without Presupposing Supersessionism, Four Fundamental Challenges. But before addressing this topic, please allow me to express my deep gratitude for the remarkable opportunities that the Corcoran Chair provides me, enabling me to continue writing on Jewish-Christian relations, a topic close to my heart for the last 30 years, ever since I first studied in Jerusalem in 1990. I'm most grateful for the stimulating cooperation with James Bernauer, Ruth Langer, Camille Fitzpatrick Markey. And I'm also grateful to the Vice Provost for Faculties, Billy Sue, and his staff, who have ceaselessly explored and found ways for me to work at Boston College in the midst of and in spite of the ongoing pandemic, which requests that so many of us work remotely. Reading the New Testament without presupposing supersessionism. That's the topic for today's lecture. And as many of you already know, supersessionism is the understanding that Judaism is not only another religion than is Christianity, but that in terms of chronology and quality, it could and should be described as a prologue to Christianity. In history, it is argued Judaism preceded Christianity and theologically Christianity should proceed in the future without Judaism. Judaism paved the way for Christianity and it should also make way for Christianity. As many of you know, this way of thinking has been extraordinarily influential in Christian theology. However, as many of us who seek other ways to describe the relationship between Judaism, and we are convinced that the biblical texts provide us with an earlier and less traveled by way of relating the two religious traditions to each other. Hence, many of the questions that we pose are old, as old as is the Christian tradition, and some of the answers that we articulate are new, 
and they make it possible for us to read the text in such a way that the inherent Jewishness of the early Christian movement is taken into consideration to much a higher extent than only a couple of decades ago. Both the historical Jesus and the historical Paul are now firmly situated in late Second Temple Judaism, and the post-70 CE writers of the New Testament, they form their theology and write their texts in the wake of the destruction of the temple, when all branches of Judaism had to cope with the fact that the sanctuary was no more. When a growing number of scholars currently read the New Testament text, Judaism is no, uh, not portrayed as the gloomy background from which Christianity had to be removed in order to glow and grow. On the contrary, it is to the Jewish matrix one must return in order to appreciate the New Testament text more fully. It, uh, it is as if the renowned yet enigmatic words of T.S. Eliot could be applied to this area of research. Quote, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time." Unquote. And in this lecture, I will seek to arrive where Christianity started. And I will seek to know the earliest Christian movement for the first time, before the supersessionism paradigm, the one that sets Christianity over against Judaism as if they were two separate religious systems before that began to govern most of the th our theological imagination. And I would like to suggest that there are four major challenges in traditional Christian readings of the New Testament that in various ways hinder improved Jewish Christian relations. And they are related to four parts of the New Testament. It is the Pharisees in the three synoptic gospels, i.e. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's the Jews, so uh, as they it's often translated in the Gospel of John. It's the concept of the law in Paul's epistles. And finally, the, the, the concept, the new covenant in the letters to the Hebrews. These four topics constantly surface in the sea of Jewish Christian relations in history as well as today. So first, a few words about the synoptic Pharisees. Let me first tell you a story. A couple of decades ago, when the New Testament was translated anew into Swedish, Mark 14, 43 was translated incorrectly. The context in, this, in that pericope is that Jesus is together with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane when a group of people approached them in order to capture Jesus. And in the Greek, it says that it was a crowd from, quote, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, unquote. However, in the Swedish translation, one reads that the group consisted of, quote, Pharisees, the scribes, and the elders, unquote. Although no manuscripts in the world support such a translation. And when I detected this, I immediately wrote to the so-called Bible Commission, and I promptly got a very polite answer that this error had already been identified and that would be corrected in the next translation, and it was. Hence, this was obviously a mistake, but it was a mistake in the shape of a tip of an iceberg, an iceberg which for centuries had taken for granted that a typical opponent in the New Testament must be a typical Pharisee. And as I've already mentioned, the error was corrected in the new translation and it was published in the year 2000. There is a phenomenon that could be called pan pharisization i.e. that you, see, you, you seek for and you find Pharisees everywhere. The pan pharisization in the history of interpretation of the New Testament. And one can detect several steps in the development towards this pan pharisization First, the first step that the Markan, Matthean, and Lucan Pharisees, who of course are narrative characters in three distinct narratives, are squeezed into one single historical category. When I wrote my doctoral thesis, narrative criticism was quite influential in the 80s and 90s, and it helped us to see the distinct features of the characters of each gospel. For a long time, we have recognized, of course, that Johannine Christology is different from Markan Christology. And in a similar way, the Markan so-called Pharisees are different from the Matthean Pharisees and the Lucan Pharisees, etc. All of them are characters in a particular text, and they are not historical people of flesh and blood. 
Now, the difference is, of course, not as vast as the one between vicious mothers-in-law in the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm and in real life, but there is nevertheless a discrepancy, and this must not be ignored. One cannot go from story to history without taking in consideration that there may be narrative generalizations in the text, generalizations that are spurred by a theological agenda. That's the first step. The second step is to depict the syntheses of the synoptic Pharisees, not as bad Pharisees, as they are sometimes are presented and when they are criticized in the Talmud, but as typical Pharisees, i.e. that all Pharisees are hypocrites and all hypocrites are Pharisees. And the third step is this unsettling trajectory. It doesn't end here, Dayeno but it continues by presenting these typical Pharisees as typical Jews, and thereby presenting the entire Jewish tradition as both hypocritical and burdensome to the extent that it is unbearable. And the fourth step, and that there is a disheartening changelessness in the anti-Pharisaic discourse. And one particularly palpable example I found when I attended a, a conference in November in the US was Gera, Gary Tyre's book, Defeating Phariseeism, Recovering Jesus' Disciple-Making Method, published in 2009. And he writes on page six, quote, it has become more and more apparent that the Phariseeism we find Jesus wrestling with in the gospel is alive and well in our evangelical churches, unquote. Hence, the task for Christians today, as Geritaira presents it, is to discern the Phariseeism in Christian communities today and to oppose it. Now, the urgency of the quest of the historical Pharisees is to a high extent related to the four steps of this deeply disturbing trajectory that I presented, from narrative characters to historical fact, from atypical Pharisees to typical Pharisees, from Pharisees to Jews, and from antiquity to modern times. Now, interestingly enough, it has been suggested that this pan pharisaization is to be detected not only in the modern reception history of the New Testament, but also in its prehistory. Allow me to read a couple of verses from the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, quote, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all this, and that's the teaching of Jesus, and they ridiculed him. So he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts, for what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. End of quote. Many years ago, Thomas Walter Manson suggested that it would be more fitting if this saying originally referred to the Sadducees rather than the Pharisees, since the Sadducees held the great vested interest. And secondly, there may be a linguistic wordplay here, that the three letters Tzadeh, Dalet, and Kof form the root of both Sadducees and righteous, Tzadikim. And I always find it intriguing when we have reason to believe that we can detect the Semitic wordplay under the surface of the Greek text. And in addition, thirdly, this saying of Jesus in Luke is directly related to the previous parable of the unjust steward who swindles his masters. And as all preachers know, this is a parable which is notoriously difficult to interpret. And the conclusion of that parable is that one should use the mammon in this world in such a way that one will be welcomed into the dwelling that are everlasting. Now, since the Sadducees did not believe in the world to come, this comment would have been particularly itching for them. And therefore, Manson reconstructs the message of this saying uh, by the Luke and Jesus in the following words, quote, You are the people who, by taking the name Sadducee, make public claim to be the party of righteousness, but God looks deeper than party labels and knows that the name does not correspond to any real righteousness, end of quote. You may or may not be convinced by Manson's conjecture. However, if he is right, then this particular pericope is another example of the shift of focus from several distinct Jewish groups in late Senka Temple Judaism to only one, the Pharisees. Yes, if he's correct, then in a fascinating way, there is in the Lucan redaction of this saying in antiquity, 
an impetus similar to the driving force behind the mistranslation of the New Testament into Swedish in modernity, and that is the pan pharisization And two conclusions can be made so far, and both of them are important. Not all blameworthy were Pharisees, and not all Pharisees were blameworthy. So far, I pointed out that the bad Pharisees have been understood as typical Pharisees, and these bad and typical Pharisees as typical Jews, and that takes us to the next category. It's time to turn to the fourth gospel, the Gospel of John. This gospel is notoriously ambiguous. It speaks of both what is revealed and what is concealed. Clement of Alexandria called it a spiritual gospel, pneumatikon evangelion, and simultaneously it articulates incarnational theology, i.e. that the word became flesh more than any other gospel. It solemnly declares that God loves the world, but the disciples are encouraged not to do the same. And whereas numerous readers find the Gospel of John comforting, some think of it as theologically problematic. One reason being the issue I'm talking about now, the ways Jews are described. Now, this list could be longer, but these examples illuminate that there are numerous ambiguities in this text, and it seems reasonable, I believe, to assume that the author deliberately wrote the text in this way. Hence, ambiguities form an important part of the author's pedagogical strategy. In other words, the author's wish to nurture the disciples who read the text cannot be separated from the ambiguities in the text. One is reminded of Carl Gustav Jung's statement that we become more mature as human beings when we acknowledge the ambiguities in life. And misunderstandings in this gospel are part of the learning process and they help the readers reach higher levels of understanding and gain new insights. In his article on the New Testament in the Jewish Encyclopedia, Kaufmann Kohler famously described the Gospel of John as, quote, a gospel of Christian love and of Jew hatred, end of quote. And the chief reason for this, and many of you are aware of this fact, is that the Gospel of John uses the Greek word judaioi, uh, often translated as Jews, in a way that has been decidedly detrimental to Jews. As Adele Reinhardt, one of my esteemed predecessors at the Corker and Visiting Chair, writes in one of her many books on this gospel, Befriending the Beloved Gospel, she writes, quote, each of the 70 references to the Jews in the Gospel of John felt like a slap in the face, end of quote. Hence, there are as many as 70 occurrences of this word in the Gospel of John, but only 17 in the three other Gospels in the New Testament. And every introduction to John must address this issue. How are we to understand John's usage of Yudayoi? Let me give you the five most important interpretations. A. It may strike you as offensive to use the word racism when describing the first interpretation, but it's a matter of fact that the racial biological discourse that has referred to Christian sources frequently has quoted the Gospel of John, and especially chapter 8, verse 44, in which it says that the father of the Jews is the devil. However, we must also stress that the racist understanding of hoyodayoi is anachronistic. The nomenclature belongs to later ages, and many argue that we can discern the first instances of it in Spain after 1492. And in terms of racial biology, Jesus and the first disciples were all Jews. And this is also the message of chapter 4, verse 22, in which Jesus states, salvation is from the Jews. And it's very often pointed out that the parents of the blind man in the ninth chapter are afraid of, quote, the Jews, end of quote although nothing suggests that they themselves are not Jews. So that's the first interpretation, a racial, racial understanding of Yudayoi. Now the second one, adherents of the second interpretation, think of the term as one related to religious affiliation. So the first one is racial, and the second one is religious. And today we talk about people who identify themselves with the Jewish, Christian, Muslim, religious tradition, However, this too is an anachronistic approach. Although we see signs in the Gospel of John and the gradual separation between what we now know as Judaism, what we now know as Christianity, 
the text was written far too early to allow us to think of them as two separate entities. This is the third interpretation now, not racial, not religious, but regional. Malcolm Lowe in Jerusalem has suggested that the term be understood in terms of regional antagonism between Jews stemming from Galilee in the north and from Judea in the south. Hence, Lowe argues that the Yudayoi should be translated as Judean. And this is a very interesting proposition, and it seems to be applicable in most of the 70 cases in the Gospel of John, although not in all of them, and the most famous being the question of the Samaritan woman in chapter 4, when she asks, how could you, who are a Jew from the Galilee, ask me for water? The fourth interpretation of the racism, religious, regional, is that it relates to the ruling classes. It has also been suggested that the term refers to the ruling classes, the religious establishment in Jerusalem. Franz Musner writes, in the expression, the Jews so often weighed in the Gospel of John with a negative accent, it is the opponents of Jesus from the leading class and especially the chief priests who are thought of. End of quote. And now finally, the fifth interpretation thinks of it not in terms of racism, religious, regional, but and ruling, but as a rhetorical term of rejection, that Yudayoi are those who by definition are wrong. It doesn't cover all the instances, but it covers most of them. As Kaiser wrote in his uh, famous book uh, on the Maverick Gospel, any person who refuses to accept the human identity proposed by Christ in the gospel is for the evangelist a Jew. Kaiser calls it a stereotype of rejection. So that's the fifth R. Interestingly, the opposite seems to be Israelite. And one is reminded of chapter 1, verse 47, in which it's stated, when Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So it's a very positive concept. Israelite, whereas uh, uh, Judaios is a very negative one. And we cannot ascertain whether we detect the Semitic popular etymology behind 131, in which it says that Jesus will be seen by Israel, but it certainly triggers the mind that Israel here is interpreted as Ishrael, a person who saw God. Something that we see also in later Christian sources, for example, Melito of Sardis in his Peripascha uh, homily. This takes me to my third part of this lecture, the law in Pauline theology. So we now turn to Paul, the author of the oldest texts that are part of the Christian canon. Methodologically, one should first study the concept Pharisaioi and Judaioi, but chronologically, the law in the Pauline epistles is the principal question. To put it bluntly, if we do not get Paul right, nothing will be right. If we begin to grasp what Paul meant, his context, his mission, we have better chances to understand the message of the other New Testament writings. And my modest purpose now is simply to highlight three traits of particular importance to the issues that are discussed now in this lecture. The Torah as a burden, the Torah as a set of boundaries, and the Torah using the Hebrew word for covenant as brit. Those are my three points here. So first, the Torah as burden. The first line of thought presents an apostle who is weighed down by with guilt. To previous generations of scholars, especially among those who identify themselves with the Lutheran tradition, it was a given that the pre-Christian Paul was burdened with guilt. Hence, keeping the mitzvot is thus the opposite of Christian faith. In other words, a Torah-centered Judaism is bad Christianity, and it is the road Christians are always tempted to choose, but are never supposed to take. Halachic Judaism becomes the prototype for the kind of Christian faith that is undeveloped, because it's still concerned with the law. It's ungrateful, because it doesn't realize what Christ has done and has to proffer, and maybe it's even uncough, because it rejects the Christian gospel. In short, Judaism is an expression of theological insubordination. In Pamela Eisenbaum's word, Judaism is presented as the ultimate paradigm of bad religion. 
this has been very, very influential. However, Krista Stendhal's influential essay, published in English in 1963, and those of us who read Swedish texts had the privilege to be able already in 1960, three years earlier. He wrote an, an influential essay on Paul and the introspective conscience of the West, and it was groundbreaking, and it's still a must read for all those who wish to acquaint themselves with Pauline theology. In this article, Stendhal famously stated that Paul had a, quote, rather robust conscience, end of quote. What role then does the Torah play in Pauline theology? And this takes us to the new perspective on Paul. That's my second point, the Torah as a set of boundaries. A growing number of scholars seek to do justice to first century Judaism, not merely presenting it as a rhetorical, gloomy background to early Christianity. And the article on the new perspective written by James Dunn, published in 1983, was therefore due to come and was a most welcome correction of much what, of what previously had been written in Pauline scholarship. It is of great advantage that the Torah nowadays is less often described as a juggernaut that crushes people beneath. Today, most, most Pauline scholars are aware of the apologetic concern that characterized and constrained and constricted earlier scholarship. The supporters of the new perspective focus on the Torah as a set of identity markers. Berit Milah, circumcision, kashrut, food laws, Shabbat, Sabbath, etc. And it thereby becomes a theological obstacle because they lead to exclusivism. In other words, halacha is presented as something that's wrong, not because it constitutes a burden, but because it creates boundaries between people. And hence, according to this line of thought, by breaking down barriers and crossing boundaries, Paul establishes a religious society which is characterized by boundlessness. This emphasis on Torah as a set of identity markers, providing Israel with social boundaries is certainly not incorrect, but we are inclined to argue that it is incomplete when seeking to understand the mission of Paul. If it were true that Paul wanted to break down barriers between Jews and Gentiles, and I soon contest this, we have to keep in mind that he most certainly reinstated inclusiveness, albeit in a new form. All this is to say that we need a third perspective, which is called the radical new perspective in Paul. As it is grateful to the promoters of the new perspective, but nevertheless, it seeks to formulate Pauline theology in an alternative way, a way which furthers our understanding of first century Judaism and earliest Christianity. The Torah to Paul is not a burden, it's not primarily a boundary, but it's something else. It's an expression of covenantal particularity and a sign of the covenant, the Brit. I return to the groundbreaking scholarship of Chris Stendhal. He stressed that Paul's self-understanding must be the cornerstone of modern attempt to reconstruct his theology. We have to understand how Paul understood himself. And an important component of Stendhal's reconstruction is first, that Paul describes himself in the letters as apostle to the Gentiles, or sent to the nation, to ethne. And second, Stendhal emphasized that Paul, when describing his experience on the way to Damascus, used a terminology from the prophetic text in the scriptures. Hence, his experience should be classified as a vocation rather than a conversion. Someone who converts changes religious system, but the one who is called receives a special assignment. And Paul was convinced that the God of Israel gave him a special assignment. His mission was to carry the message of Christ to the nations. And this means that the relationship between people and peoples, between Am Yisrael, the people of Israel, and the nations of the world is of central importance. And Stendhal said, if we're looking for a center in his epistle to the Romans, it's not to be found in the first chapters, but rather in chapters 9 and 10 and 11. Stendhal writes, quote, I'm convinced that Pauline theology has its organizing center in Paul's apostolic perception of his mission to the Gentiles, quote. <laughs> This means that the discourse of justification by faith in the Pauline epistles cannot be isolated from his mission and work. Pagans are offered a relationship with God, not defined by the Jewish law, but through faith in Christ, because they are pagans and not Jews. 
As Stendhal quite correctly points out, that the law is not associated with the discourse of conscience and guilt, but with the covenantal theology. In sum, Torah is not to be described as a burden to the halachic person, nor primarily at boundaries, but rather as the Hebrew concept brit, covenant. In short, observing the commandment is not a desperate attempt to please God. It's a way to respond to gracious God. When reading the Pauline epistles, one must remember that the word Torah in Jewish theology does not stand for a problem to be solved, but a life to be lived. Torah is an inherently positive concept. And now I turn to my fourth and last part of this lecture, the letters to the Hebrews. When we study how the different parts of the New Testament have been interpreted, there is no single text that to a greater degree than the letter to the Hebrew has cemented the fatal notion that it is a fundamental to Christian faith that Judaism and Christianity could and should be described as two covenants and that the new covenant is better than the previous one. It's perhaps not surprising that this has happened. After all, the Greek word diatheke, covenant, it occurs 33 times in the entire New Testament, of which 14 in Hebrews alone. In other words, almost half of all evidence is found in this single text. Now, there is no doubt that this is how Hebrews is almost always interpreted. But in my opinion, it would be strange if such an early text, and it should reasonably be dated to the time around the fall of the Second Temple in 70 CE, that it expressed the programmatic and problematic replacement theology that came to be developed only later, when it was possible to consider and describe Judaism and Christianity as two sharply defined religions. Have we, that's the question, have we sufficiently reflected that this is a text written before they were perceived as two different religious systems? It's important to note that the, the expression, the new covenant for the anonymous author of the book of Hebrews, and we don't know who wrote this text, and it should probably actually be perceived as a sermon rather than an epistle. Above all, that the new covenant, above all, it belongs to the future. In other words, the letter to the Hebrews is thus far, far, far more eschatological than biblical scholars and other readers of the Bible have realized and taken into consideration. And this should not really surprise us. If both the oldest letters by Paul and the oldest gospel tradition, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are eschatological, then why should not the oldest preserved Christian sermon also be eschatological? Hebrews thus presupposes the dialectics between the present and the future. The, the author writes, we now live in the time that is, eiston kairon ton en este kota, Hebrews 9.9. And the author longs for the time for a better order, Mechri Cairo the Orthosios Epikemena, Hebrews 9.10. The heavenly service in which Jesus Christ serves as high priest is already in progress. It's invisible to human eyes, it's inaudible to human ears, it's incomprehensible to human thoughts. But the time of the new era has not yet completely broken. And this becomes especially clear in Hebrews 8.13, where it said that the old covenant, quote, will soon disappear. Engis afanismu. This verse is not to be understood as a precise prediction of the fall of the temple, nor a fervent hope that Judaism will soon cease to exist but as an expression of an eschatological longing for the future, for a complete and perfected world. It would thus be anachronistic to assume that what is compared in Hebrews is Christianity and Judaism. Instead, the future and the perfect are compared to the earthly and fragmentary. In short, what is being compared is heaven and earth, and the author of Hebrews states, not surprisingly, that the heavenly is perfect, and the earthly is deficient. The new is better than the old because the kingdom of heaven is better than earthly life. This line of thought is presented in more detail in a chapter of a book that I co-edited some 10 years ago, together with Philip Cunningham, Joseph Siever, Mary Boyce, and Hans-Hermann Henriks, 
The book is called Christ Jesus and the Jewish People Today. And I dare say that this interpretation of the he letter to the Hebrews has become relatively influential, as shown by the 18th paragraph in a Roman Catholic document from 2015 that deals with Jewish Christian relations. Quote, at issue in the epistle to the Hebrews is not the contrast of the old and new covenants as we understand them today, nor a contrast between the church and Judaism. Rather, the contrast is between the eternal heavenly priesthood of Christ and the transitory earthly priesthood, end of quote. This document was written 50 years after uh, the Nostra Aetate, and I was born in 1965, and it so happened that I read this passage on my birthday, December 13th, uh, 50 years after the promulgation of the Nostra Aetate. Now, in other words, I argue that the comparative paradigm that has governed so much of Jewish-Christian relations is based on a flawed reading of Hebrews, which fails to take into consideration the role of the early Christian apocalypticism when interpreting this text. To conclude, the four parts of this lecture and the frequently used key words remind me of the old saying that the woman entering a covenant is encouraged to wear, quote, something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue, end of quote. This sentence has been understood in several ways, and today I would like to refer to the following interpretation. Something old stands for continuity, something new for optimism for the future, something borrowed for happiness, and something blue for affection. In other words, Jewish Christian relations and non supersessionist readings of the New Testament should seek to express the continuity between uh, the two parts of the Christian Bible, between the two faith traditions. It should also seek to convey the optimism and happiness of the earliest Christian movement for being covenantally embraced by the God of Israel. And finally, it should also articulate the mutual affection that is the fruit that honest dialogue can harvest in the words of a famous Christian 19th century minister known as the Prince of Preachers. How sweet it is when friend with friend in holy fellowship can walk, when thoughts and sympathies may blend and hearts be open as they talk. I'm profoundly grateful for the invitation to serve as the Corcoran Visiting Professor for this academic year. Thank you all for attending this lecture and I welcome your comments and your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesper, for a wonderful wide-ranging talk. And I just wanted to start off with a very basic question. Uh, you indicated to us yesterday that this is maybe the first chapter of the book that you're hoping to be working on this year. And the question is, where does this project go from here? What's, what's the, the, the scope, what context of the project itself? Oh, thank you. So the entire project is, is actually called almost the same thing as this, uh, this lecture, reading the New Testament without presupposing supersessionists. And I thought of it as a companion to the New Testament. We already have a book, and I should be waving with it uh, just now, uh, called uh, the Jewish Annotated New Testament, which is, I believe, the first uh, Jewish commentary to the entire New Testament. And this is a, a book similar to that one, without having the entire New Testament text, but uh, uh, harvesting the fruits of all these articles and books and papers and sessions and conferences for the last uh, 30 or 40 or so years that have uh, sought to read the New Testament within the matrix of early, uh, of um, Second Temple Judaism, of uh, first century Judaism. And as I said, we no longer want to remove Christianity from that matrix, but we want to return to it in order to see uh, all the parallels, uh, how uh, the, 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 the Midrashim and the parables and uh, uh, the theology helps us understand the setting of the historical Jesus and the historical Paul and the other um, texts in the New Testament. So that's my, uh, my topic, my, my task, my assignment uh, for, the, for this year.
thank you so much. Uh, we actually have a couple questions which are heading in the same direction, which is to say, how do we take bring this historical knowledge into the core curriculum and introduce practical exegetical skills from it? Uh, and what's being done in seminaries to understand that this understanding of Christian Jewish relations uh, ends up influencing those who are doing the preaching? So much can be said, and we don't have a lot of time, but I, I, I mentioned that uh, the destruction of the temple, the Khurban Habayit, that, which is so central for our understanding of um, the early rabbinic text and the, the, how, how Judaism evolved, I would like to much higher an extent um, take that also into New Testament studies and to re remind the readers of the New Testament that uh, this was, especially to Jewish Christians, of course, but I believe also to Gentile Christians, uh, um, a stigma, a trauma, and that uh, a, a numerous texts in the New Testament can be understood as a response to that catastrophe in year 70. When we look at uh, what Paul, how Paul refers to the temple, it's a positive metaphor because the temple is there. So he, for example, in Romans, he describes his own mission as he says, I'm a chief priest and I want to bring forth uh, the Gentiles as a, an offering, as a korban to to the God of Israel. After year 70, we have other texts in the New Testament and they can't refer to the temple in the same way. And therefore they have to find ways, a leap for life, find ways for this early Jewish movement because it was still a Judaism to survive the fall, the destruction of the temple. So that's just one example uh, to, to see uh, the, the, the trauma uh, of the Khurban Habayit uh, is something that unites uh, Jews of various uh, strands and early Christianity was one of those Judaisms. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from a member of our theology faculty, uh, from David Hunter. He says, not being a New Testament scholar, I'm wondering how well accepted your interpretation of the epistle to the Hebrews has been among New Testament scholars. It seems quite plausible to me, but again, I'm not a New Testament specialist. And uh, to, to paraphrase that slightly, what are some of the possible challenges for this interpretation that others would raise? I think that the, the epistle to the Hebrews is still very often read as the first Christian uh, doctrinal document that we read the Pauline epistles as early uh, as part of the New Testament and and uh, of course the Gospels but when uh, p uh, students of the New Testament have been reading Hebrews it has been much more of a systematic approach for example the, this I mentioned diatheke, the the Greek word for covenant that when, when, when one thinks of it, that it is uh, written almost at the same time as the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John. And whereas we constantly think of the Gospels as um, giving vent not only to what happened in year 30, but also to what happened in year 70, 80, very often Hebrew has been drifting away and un been understood as, as an early Christian document describing two covenants, two religious systems, and we didn't have that up until much, much later. Daniel Boyarin, for example, in some of his books, talks about that it, it takes several hundred years for Judaism and Christianity to define themselves vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, it was interesting to see in this Roman Catholic document I quoted uh, in 2015, it says that the reason for not referring to Hebrews in Nostra Aetate is that it doesn't talk about Judaism and Christianity. So that means that this document clearly is on the same side of the fence as I am. But I, I uh, nevertheless, I believe that most take for granted when they read it, that it's about two separate entities Judaism, Christianity. So I hope that is a, a short, short answer to a, a, a vast question. I think that, yes, uh, these questions are all vast. Uh, I, we have a question from one of our graduate students, 
uh, that you said that Torah should not be understood primarily as burden or boundaries, especially in an, inclu an exclusivist sense, but as a covenantal particularity. Can you say more about how your project may be able to help clarify what covenant means, maybe offering a more concrete definition? Hmm. I had more, of course, uh, as he says in Gospel of John, I have more to say, but if I didn't, I had to uh, minimize it because I only had some 35, 40 minutes. So I would say that, uh, it, it's it's clear for me when I read when I reread Paul that he knew that the Torah was for the Jewish nation. In that sense, uh, it's true that it's set of boundaries, identity markers. But at the same time, he is also crystal clear. I would say that the Torah is not for uh, the pagans, and that made it difficult for them because they wanted to uh, relate to the God of Israel but the Romans didn't look upon themselves, uh, look upon them as, uh, as Jews, but as non-obedient uh, non-Jews. And therefore, uh, it was very difficult for them. So um, this is something we see also in uh, uh, post-colonial writings on the, uh, emphasizing the, the oppression of the Roman tyranny, that it was difficult for them and Paul was convinced that the, the, the end of the world was near. It was a matter of uh, months, uh, years, but no more, absolutely not more than a generation. And therefore, he wanted to, to as I said, bring forth them as a holy gift to the God of Israel. Um, uh, so I think uh, the language of justification is, is understood as a way for the Gentiles, qua Gentiles, to be um, covenantally embraced. And it's a parallel to uh, what the Torah is, that Christ is the parallel for pagans, what the Torah is for Jews. At the end of the day, the bottom line is that either when you read the New Testament, you think that Judaism was such a bad religion, so Jesus had to come. And we've tried that for 2,000 years. And then there's another road less traveled by, and it says Judaism was such a good religion, so God wanted to add something to that. And therefore, uh, the, the, the theologians called the Christ event was given as a parallel way for the pagans to be included in the covenant. Now, systematic theologians uh, think a lot about one covenant, two covenants. I don't think that's a, a Pauline way of thinking. Uh, he provides us with metaphors, parables uh, being grafted in, etc. But he says, do we uh, make void the law, the Torah? No, we, 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 uh, we, uh, um, the opposite of of uh, making void, we we confirm it. Yeah. I hope that's helpful. Okay, uh, we have another question from a, a member of our community, our wider community, and someone who's taken a lot of classes with us. Uh, she, she writes: future acceptance of Jesus's role as high priest would still be supersessionist as it would involve, would it involve Jewish acceptance of Jesus's importance vis-a-vis -vis Christology? Uh, does this ask Jews to change Jewish theology, but not really expect any change from Christian theology? Oh, thank you. I think I would like to return to what I said in the beginning on the Churban Habayit, that the, the, the trauma of the destruction of the temple, we don't know when, uh, the epistle to the Hebrews was written either just before 70, uh, or immediately afterwards, but it seems to be very much related to that. And I think for, for someone belonging to what we now today call Christianity, the early Christian movement, uh, for them, this was a sign of hope that in this world, we have catastrophes, we have earthquakes and tsunamis and coronavirus and uh, Roman oppression and but there is another world and for him the writer 
uh, this was a way of looking into what is true and looking away from what is only fragmentary and transitory. Uh, whether or not that is supersessionist or not, I think still that, is, that would be coming from it's a modern point of view. I'm reminded of um, Mark Heim's book on salvation, that when he talks about that there are parallel paths today in this world, and who knows that eventually, if we're talking about salvations in the plural, that eventually there will be uh, the, the Jewish uh, expectations, the Muslim expectation, the Christian expectation, etc. they will all be confirmed because uh, also in Haulam Haba, there will be particularity. I'm not saying that I subscribe to this entirely. I'm not asking all of you to do that, but I think that is the way we should understand Hebrews. It was written very difficult situation and he seeks to encourage uh, what we today call Jewish Christians to believe in that there is a, an invisible reality that is uh, a hope uh, for the future also when things are very difficult in this world. Thank you. A uh, question from Matthew Tapey from Florida. Uh, can you comment on Romans 9, 6? Not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. He points out this is a key text in medieval readings that signal to interpreters that the covenant mentioned in just a few verses above in verse 4 refers to a deficient covenant now replaced with a covenant of grace. Uh, can you comment on how Paul's law here is not presented as a burden? Or have you considered a non-supersessionist reading of this influential part of Romans. Thank you. Uh, we keep returning to chapters nine and ten and eleven of uh, of Romans, and those who follow in the steps of Chris Stendhal, as I do, we find uh, the verses that help us. And those who have, may have another understanding, they find the verses that they are uh, f in which they find support. For example, ten four, uh, that Christ is the telos of the law. I, Christa said in his book, um, the, the 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 last book he wrote on on Romans, um, that Paul had two problems, and one was Paul, and then the, the other one was Israel, and that I think that it was a typical Chris Stendhal tongue-in-cheek commentary comment that he had difficulties with with Paul that he wasn't understood he was misunderstood he wasn't accepted and also that he had this uh, trauma the stigma of some kind we don't know what what it was and he, he felt that he could have been a better apostle had he not had that problem and the other thing that he keeps thinking of what are the consequences for Israel and uh, I don't think that he he goes as far that he includes um, uh, the Gentiles into Israel, but they are grafted into the covenant. But that uh, he he wrestles with this, and I, as I read Romans, I have to read all sixteen chapters in order to to see the narrative flow in in the text, uh, and that helps me to to sum up what I believe is most important, for example, in, in chapter 15, where he says that, that everything we say, uh, we Christians, if we use that expression now, it must underline the trustworthiness of God vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish people. And everything we say must help us um, enhance uh, the gratefulness of Gentile Christians, that they praise the mercy of, of God. So I, I, I think I, I keep reading the entire epistle to the Romans in the light of those verses in chapter 15. But this is something, of course, I would like to return to in my book. Uh, it's always easier to do it at book length. And one final question, because we're almost out of time, um, from A.J. Levine. Uh, 
where she's basically, I'm going to summarize what she writes because it's a little bit long. She says, do you think that reconstructing history is so difficult that historical critical exegesis is going to be insufficient for combating supersessionist interpretations of the New Testament and even of rabbinic literature? What would be some of the untapped opportunities in the historical critical method, or are there other methods that will be helped will help more if they're ones based in ethics and theology. Yeah, thank you. How much could be said uh, as a response to that very interesting question as well? Yes, I, I believe in a combination. Uh, we need a good, sound historical scholarship. James Parks wrote many years ago that uh, good the theology cannot be based on bad history. So we need to uh, reread the text and remember that Judaism was the historical context and not the theological contrast. But in, we also have to, um, I believe, use the tools that Christian theology uh, provides. For example, uh, concepts of shechina in Christian, um, the divine presence in, in um, in Christian theology, it's based on the Gospel of John. And once again, after Churban Habayit, the destruction of the temple, John says that it is possible to live a Christian life here and now, because the one who believes in Jesus, as John understands it, has already left death and has already uh, been um, and gathered uh, is already in a new era, in a new uh, Ion. So I, I believe that, and this is too brief now, of course, that, that uh, the, construct, the, the, the tools that constructive theology provides uh, need to be combined with the insights of historical scholarship. So uh, I always thought during my 10 years in Jerusalem, when I served as the Chris Stendhal professor, that the best question in interreligious relations was tell me how does god reveal god's self in your tradition i would like to know more about that and then you 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 see how you build bridges uh, between the various faith traditions they aren't saying the same thing uh, because history doesn't repeat itself as mark twain says but it rhymes it doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes and these rhymes i find very fascinating how god can reveal god's self in different contexts in different texts to different groups of people not in identically but as a theological rhyme and that is what i would like to explore uh, in the coming academic year Thank you.